Let's pray. We thank you for life and we thank you for the gospel that makes life worth living. We pray you'll minister that gospel to us again today. In Christ's name, amen. You may recall that we began the last meeting by saying if the world believes three words of scripture, it would turn this globe into a paradise. And those three words, of course, are God is love. It's not sufficient to know that there's a God. It's only sufficient to know that he loves us, that he loves us even when we're bad, when we're weak, when we're foolish. How can we be sure of that? Well, the best revelation of God is in Christ. And last time we began by going through the first book of the New Testament and noticing how Christ imaged his heavenly father. I want to say a little more on that today and then in our second meeting we will deal with the question, have you received the Holy Spirit? Very important question because Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's a pretty scary statement. You will know the answer as regards yourself, Lord willing, before you leave here today. So I'm going to go back now to Matthew and the 14th chapter. We look a little more at Christ's revelation of God so that we can be sure, yes, he is love, even to those who are unloving like me and you. Matthew 14 tells of two feasts, a banquet by a king followed by a murder and a martyrdom and then an outdoor party on the hillside. All they had was a few sardines, each person, and some barley bread, but it was much more delicious than the banquet in Herod's hall. So we're going to look at that story in Matthew chapter 14. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist, he's risen from the dead. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John, bound him, put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people. They considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. King was distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Can you picture this? Here is the cousin of Christ, the only person on earth to whom he could open his heart and talk about his mission. They're about the same age, and John was the greatest man who'd ever lived. But now our Lord sees in the martyrdom of John a hint of his own coming death. So at this stage of the story in the Gospels, Christ has experienced discouragement after discouragement, repulse after repulse, rejection by the leaders, obstinate unbelief by the people. And now this, his best friend, his cousin, his forerunner, is put to death. So things are pretty bad. But now let's look at the second feast, please. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Please remember, this is God the Son. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. 
Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages, buy themselves some food. Jesus said they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread, two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me. He directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children, probably about 20,000 when you think there are usually more children than there are parents around. This is a remarkable story not just because of the miracle, because God is doing this all the time. Christ just did it quickly. All the time God brings from seeds buried in the earth food for us to eat. God has given so much, so generously on our world that we only have to gather it. And Christ's miracle here was just an intensification of what God is doing all the time. But I want you to notice this. Herod's party finishes with a murder. Christ's party, in mid-swing, he looks up to heaven and breaks the loaves. And one year later, he would do the same, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. And he would take the wine and say, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. So this is an intimation of what would happen a year later. In other words, this is a preview of Calvary. They're in a desert place. They're hungry. They can't supply their own needs. That's all of us. This world is a desert place, spiritually, and we can't provide our own needs but God is willing to provide for everyone who seeks him. Christ alone is the bread of life. Unless we eat this bread, we'll die. We'll die eternally. So, Herod's party ends with a murder and a remorse that will never go away. The worm that dieth not, the fire that's not quenched, is in his conscience, in his soul, until he falls into the grave. Christ's feast is different. He's looking forward to another death, but a death that would give life and joy and happiness, the exact opposite of the Herodian banquet. You remember that there was another feeding of the thousands where he had more to start with, but he fed less and he had less left over. So you have to ask the question, How many could he have fed if he'd only had a crumb? Now, do you understand me? When he had more to start with, he had less left over and he fed less. When he had less to start with, he fed more and there was more left over. Makes you think of God's tool chest in 1 Corinthians 3, how God takes the things that are despised and the things that are not and works miracles with them. Let's see what follows after that. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Why was that? Because the crowd wanted to make him a king. They're saying, this is the man who can lead our armies. He can heal the wounded. He can provide food for the people. So he dismisses them. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Now I want you to be very careful to understand what follows. Here is a picture of Christ ascending, interceding, then returning to save. Now do you understand what I'm saying? This is a picture of 2,000 years of history. After the breaking of the body of Christ on the cross, he went up on high to intercede for us. The disciples in the boat on the stormy sea, 
is a picture of the church amid the persecutions from non-believers. And in the fourth watch of the night, when it looks like the boat is going down, which prefigures the end of the world, when it looks like the church will be wiped out, time of trouble such as never was, Christ comes down from the mountain, Christ will come back from heaven. So what you have in this story, the breaking of the loaves, Calvary, him going up on the mountain, his ascension to heaven, where he intercedes, church in the boat, storms, troubles of life, preaching the gospel brings reactions. And then when it looks like the church is going to be absolutely destroyed, Christ comes down and saves them. Picture of the second advent. So never forget it. You have in one chapter here, predicted in type and symbol, 2,000 years of history. That's one of the many evidences that this book is a supernatural book. Then there's a story that's rather sad. It's about Peter. Lord, if it's you, this is verse 28, Peter says, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter's always the same whether you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. He's always ahead of all the others and he's rash. So Jesus says, come. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now this is a preview of a fall by Peter one year later. If he'd learned from this event, he would never have denied his Lord three times and been scared by a servant girl. Please understand, big falls are preceded by little falls. It's best to avoid the little falls. Whatever you and I do carelessly in earlier times, we're inclined to multiply in later times. Very good rule in life about evil, resist beginnings. Five million people a year die from tobacco. Most of the people who die from tobacco wanted to give it up and tried. If they'd resisted beginnings, it would have saved five million deaths every year. So regards anything evil, resist beginnings. Peter here acts out what will happen on a much larger scale. And please get the point, it's when he looked at the stormy waters and when he looked away from Jesus that the trouble came. That's my experience. That's your experience. You know we think a lot about electricity since the days of Edison. But electricity works in two different ways. Sometimes it seems congealed in something that we can carry with us. Batteries, always there. Press a button and you've got it. The other way electricity comes, there has to be a contact made. Probably electrical lines. Now this is true of the Christian life. The second is the only way the Christian life will work. It doesn't work the first way. There's no Christian on earth that's got so much of the Holy Spirit, so much of Christ in him, he can just press a button and it works. No, no. We only have the power. We only have the Spirit. We only have the Christ if we're in constant contact, which is the most common way electricity is used. You understand me. The Christian life is not the battery principle where you've got it stirred up, stored up, and you can turn it on at any time. No, no, no. Christian life demands constant contact. Very, very important. Peter ruptured the contact, was sinking. Christ saved him. It was to happen a year later. Peter would have suicided like Judas, but it says the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And that was such a look that lifted him up and saved him from suicide. And later, after his resurrection, Christ sent a message, tell my disciples and Peter. He remembered Peter and loved him still. Now I want you to look please at the 15th chapter. <coughs> Very important principle here about two types of religion. A religion that is outward, a religion that is formal, and religion of the heart. Some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, 
Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, it's a good idea to wash your hands before you eat, but this is not talking about hygiene. This is talking about ritualistic washing up to the elbows, all sorts of fussings. It's not talking about hygiene. It's talking about traditions. And Christ in his reply says, you by your traditions break the commandments of God. And he illustrates it. And then you have a quotation from the book of Isaiah. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then if you'll notice, please, in verse 10, he calls the crowd to him and says, listen and understand what goes into a man's mouth doesn't make him unclean. What comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. Not talking about hygiene, not talking about health. But what it's saying is very important. What comes out of the mouth makes us unclean. You know, the old-fashioned doctor that said, stick out your tongue, he was a pretty wise old guy. Our tongue reveals us. Our tongue reveals every one of us. All of us regret many times when we've spoken when we should have been silent. We very rarely regret having been silent when we should have spoken. So he's warning us that if we're careless with speech, that makes the heart revealed as unclean. The disciples say the Pharisees are offended and he answered, every plant my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. In other words, traditions. It's not enough to say the church has done this for centuries. Is it biblical? We're not traditionalists. He expands it further in the 15th verse, uh, in the 19th verse, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. Murder, evil thoughts, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Then we have a story that turns the tables and there's a story now about a heathen woman and Christ travels 100 miles to try and help her. He goes into a heathen land to help a heathen woman who's in trouble. Please look at it. <coughs> Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon and a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus didn't answer a word. Now that's not like Jesus. I want you to notice he's acting out the part of the Pharisees. He wants to give his disciples that generation all later generations, that century, all later centuries, an illustration of the difference between bad religion, which is just outward, and true religion, which is of the heart. And so he's acting out now a parable, and it hurts him to do it. A few minutes pain for him, a few minutes pain for the woman, but it would be a blessing for centuries. So let's look at it again. He didn't answer a word. Disciples came and said, send her away. She keeps crying out. And he says again, I'm sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Again, he's like the Pharisees who would have nothing to do with non-Jews. Woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Again, he's acting like the Pharisees. He's a smart lady. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And now Jesus cannot hold back any more. He loves this woman. The lesson is over. He says, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So here you have the Israel after the flesh, the Pharisees. Religion outward. Rules and regulations, but no heart. Then Israel after the spirit, represented by this woman, with her great faith, 
And it's an illustration of what our Lord said to the Samaritan woman. God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Real religions, not just church goings, not just Sabbath keeping, not just tithe paying, it's not just baptism. Real religion is loving God with the heart and loving our fellow men. That's what constitutes God's Israel. Very, very important. Well, then we have the story of another miracle. But I want you to come to the 16th chapter. And now we have a shadow again. The Pharisee and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Can you remember any reference to Sadducees before this verse? Answer, never before do they face Jesus. Now they come and they're like scavengers ready for the corpse. They're determined he will die and they're going to get him. So this is the first time in the New Testament where the Sadducees are pictured as coming. The Sadducees were the sceptics. The Pharisees were the traditionalists. Sadducees did not believe in life after death, didn't believe in angels. There are two types of people in the world, traditionalists, sceptics, on one side. On the other side, those that trust in God and that love him. So they're asking for a sign. He'd given them so many signs. What's feeding 20,000 with a few fish if that's not a sign? And he says, if you look down a bit in verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign. He's saying, in effect, your hearts are so materialistic, you don't really love God. You wouldn't understand a sign if it was given to you. A wicked and adulterous generation in the Bible, loving anything material more than God is called adultery. So he's saying you're too worldly, you wouldn't see it if it was right in front of you. Then he warns the disciples of the problem. But I want you to come please to verse 13. <clears throat> when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his people, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. What about you? Who do you say I am? Peter, you'd expect him to do the answering. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Please understand, the best insights into truth don't come because you're smart. The best insights into truth come to humble people who are looking to God and he teaches them. Christ is very emphatic. You got this by revelation. You didn't get it because you're smart. I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There are two words for rock. One that means something like a stone or a splinter of a rock, and that's the name for Peter. And the other is a word that applies to bedrock, massive bedrock. Where he was was a place where there are many temples, huge rocks like old houses. And he's saying, Peter, you're going to be the first Christian on the rock of God, the new church that I'm now about to build. That's what he's saying. That's why Peter always heads the list whenever the 12 disciples are given, which is very encouraging because there are more mistakes made by Peter than any others of the disciples. Our, dis our mistakes don't wipe us out or we're all done for. God looks at the heart that we love him. If so, we belong to him. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. This is said later to all 12. Whoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When we warn people that if they close their hearts to God, they'll miss out on heaven, we're binding them. When we tell them whatever their lives, if they come to Christ, all manner of sin and blasphemy can be forgiven under them, that looses them. 
we're only loosed and made free when we accept the love of God. From that time on, he began to explain to the disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders. What an anticlimax! Peter has just said, you're the son of the living God. Christ says, yes, and I'm going to build my church. Wonderful, glorious, anticlimax, I'm going to die. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus now doesn't say, blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah. He calls him the devil. Get behind me, Satan. Any budging from the reality of Calvary is satanic. Any religion that doesn't make the cross central verges towards satanic religion. Here's a man that's just been called blessed, made the first stone on the great foundation, and now he's called Satan. Why? Because he's trying to dodge the cross. Hey, I try to do that all the time, and so do you. Our cross is when our will clashes with the will of God, and that happens to all of us every day. That's why Christ said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Next word? daily and follow me. What's he mean? There's no cross around for me to lift up but there is a cross because God will tell me certain things that I don't want to do and I have to crucify my old nature and do them. That's taking up the cross. Then he says to his disciples, if anyone come after me he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's very hard. We can deny ourselves something a lot of people giving up such and such for Lent. You know, I could give up spinach for Lent. That wouldn't be a problem, see. But this is deny yourself, not deny yourself something, but deny your self-will. That is the mark of the Christian. We can say no to ourselves by the grace of God. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. When it says further on, what good is it for a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? That word translated soul is exactly the same Greek word, psyche, translated life in verse 25. That's very important to understand. The word soul and spirit occurs 1,700 times in the Bible. Not once does it ever say a soul or a spirit can function consciously without a body? Now, why do I stress that? Because most Christians believe otherwise. Not now so much among scholars. Scholars in all denominations in the last hundred years have come to see the biblical teaching that where the word soul is used in the Bible usually means life and it's not talking about something immaterial. Well, where did that idea come from? It came from Plato hundreds of years before Christ. It was Plato, the great Greek philosopher, who invented all sorts of things. It's from the ancient Greeks we get eternal hell fire, soul that's separate from the body, all sorts of teachings that are anti-biblical but were accepted by early Christians because their teachers had been trained in schools that taught Plato. We mustn't miss the practical point. What good will it be for a man if he gained the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? You've all heard of Jean Paul Sartre, the French existentialist. He was a filthy, dirty, blasphemous, promiscuous man and he had millions of followers. And among his followers were French politicians who became leaders of small kingdoms in Africa, Cambodia, Vietnam, and they all followed the teachings of John Paul Sartre, which left God out of the picture. But when he was on his deathbed, he said, I, I was wrong. Too late. Too late. Today is the day of salvation. Today. Be right today, and you'll probably be right tomorrow. Be right today. The warning that 
a man may gain the whole world. Sartre had everything going for him as regards popularity, but he was a very wicked man. He had a mistress, Simone de Beauvoir, who when she wrote up her biography, she said how terrible the man was with whom she'd lived for decades. And she realised she too had made a mistake. Very intelligent, not enough to be smart, it's only enough to be good. Then he talks about the second coming. Son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels, then he'll reward each person according to what he's done. Please think of the big topics here. The Christ, the church, the cross, the coming. This is Christianity. The Christ, the church, not a denomination. The church is composed of all those born again, whether they be Catholic, Methodist, Adventist, whatever. The Christ, the church, the cross. The true church always makes Calvary central. He died for me. Son of God who loved me and died for me. That's the only motive that will help me do the right thing. Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Christ, the church, the cross, the coming. Unless faith has a millennial aspect, it won't sustain people. Any teaching, religious teaching or political teaching, that doesn't also look to the future will lose control of people. But the Bible doesn't make that mistake. It promises that sin will not be forever, pain will not be forever. There's coming a day when sorrow and tears will be banished. The Lord will come again. So these are the very great topics of the 16th chapter, the Christ, the church, the cross, the coming, and also the great Christian virtues, faith, thou art the Christ. Love, love enough to deny self. Hope, he's coming again. So you have the great Christian virtues in the same chapter. Faith, love and hope. Please look at the next story. Here we've got the transfiguration. And this is the opposite of Gethsemane. In Gethsemane you'll be down in the valley. Now in the transfiguration, he's up on a mountain. This Gethsemane, he's overwhelmed with grief and pain and sorrow. Here his face is irradiated. He's all glorious. This is a very fitting end to the time at Caesarea Philippi where he sets up the church. You know, this is a miniature of the second coming predicted in the preceding verses. Let's look at it. Chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James, led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. This is a miniature of the second coming. Moses had died but was raised from the grave. Elijah never died. When Jesus comes, there'll be two groups of Christians those in the grave, those still living. So Moses represents the people who will be resurrected at the coming of Christ and Elijah represents the Christians who will be translated at the coming of Christ. They both are talking, according to Luke's record, about his decease, about his death. They were very cross-centred. Peter again speaks up and foolishly, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. A voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. KJV is even better. They saw no one but Jesus only. Jesus only. Jesus only. There's the essence of Christian faith, Jesus only. It's important to understand that. So this is a wonderful climax, conclusion to what's happened a few days before. It's always linked together, what happened with the great confession now at the Christ. It's always linked with this of the transfiguration because he's talked about the cross and we should join with the cross the coming. 
the resurrection. If there's a cross and no resurrection, if there's a cross and no coming, it's useless. So the Bible joins them and it does here. The transfiguration is a little mirror of the second advent and the two types of people. Now let's look at chapter 18, please. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, how would you have answered that? He called a little child, had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, lest you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Boy, that is a mouthful, is it not? Unless I am not childish, childlike. There's a difference, isn't there? I'm childish when I'm easily upset, when I always want my own way, when my life is full of criticism. That's childishness. When I must have this, I must have that, or I won't be happy. So there. That's childishness. But childlikeness is different. That's humility. That's meekness. That's trust. He's saying, unless I get like that, I just am not going to make it. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he enlarges that in some verses. But I want you to notice uh, the section on the brother who sins against you. Would you come down to verse 15? If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. Don't tell everybody else. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. If he won't listen, take one or two others along. So every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector, which doesn't mean you cease to love him, you cease to do anything for him. What should we do for pagans and tax collectors? We should love them. But he's saying they cannot be held up as Christ's people if they're knowingly engaged in doing evil. A true Christian church must have discipline. Discipline has to be not for violating of traditions, but violating for the essentials of the gospel. And the gospel is against evil. So a man that does evil won't listen to the church. It is the church's duty to say, you cannot represent Christ. We love you. We'll always seek the best for you but you cannot pose as a Christian while you're guilty of these things. Some of you know about Peacewise, in which my daughter is so much involved, which she started in this country. That's an endeavour to have Christians at loggerheads through the gospel to solve the problem rather going to law or rather than disgrace the church. Very wonderful procedure that Christians should always follow. But now coming again to Peter, please. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Notice how the 12 disciples, better people than we are, but legalism was inbred there. And Peter thinks he's so wonderful. He'll forgive, not twice, three times. He'll forgive up to seven times. And Jesus bowls him over. He says, Simon, 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 70 times 7. Does he mean that when you get to 489, you say, now's my chance. <laughs> After this, I sock him. <laughs> Obviously, it's not that. Obviously, Jesus is saying, you must always forgive. This is so vital. Look, we all grow up in families. In families, we learn how to live in the world. Families have disagreements. Brothers and sisters fight. Brother fights against brother. Sister fights against sister. Parents think, oh, my children, what a problem. The children think, oh, my parents, when will I be free from them? In the family, we learn to live in the world and the thing that will make it tick is forgiveness. Unless I learn to forgive in the family, I'm never going to function in the world. It's got to begin then. And then you have this marvellous story about a man who owes more money than you could count and he's 
about to have his head chopped off when the Lord to whom he owes the money says, all right, I'll forgive you. And he goes out and he finds a man who owes him one millionth as much. And he says, pay me what you owe me. And as I haven't got it, he says, all right, I'll fix you, I'll punish you. But the other servants hear about it. They come and tell the master, the man you forgave, all that money, he's taken hold of someone else who only owes him a tiny bit and he won't forgive him. So the king calls him back and he says, I forgave you. Shouldn't you have forgiven also? Now what is Jesus saying? He's saying, my debt to him is a million times greater than any debt I think exists between someone on earth and me. Please, have you got that? All of us have problems, and it's mainly from people. Most of our problems aren't earthquakes. Some people have problems from floods, but not most of us. Most of our problems are from people, and people near to us, often people dear to us. But Jesus is saying, whatever you think they owe you because they've done you wrong, it's only a millionth of what you owe God. So if you want forgiveness from him, you must forgive. It is so crystal clear in the Bible. If I cannot forgive, I will never be forgiven. Governor Oglethorpe said to John Wesley, I never forgive, Wesley said to the governor. Well, sir, I hope you never sin. And that's it, isn't it? God has to forgive me many things every day. Thoughts less than the best. Words less than the best. Actions less than the best. I need forgiveness every day. And if that is so, what must be my attitude when I'm irritated by my neighbour, my brother, my sister, my husband, whoever, my wife? Jesus is so clear. Christianity is not, not obscure. It's very plain. If I don't forgive, I will never be forgiven. So what is the essence of Christianity? Love, tenderness, gentleness, goodness, mercy. That's it. Let's take a break.